There is an outline in your bulletin. I hope that you have uh, pulled that out by now and will uh, follow along and open to the passage from Philippians chapter 1. Whether you're a football fan or not, you have to admit that the Super Bowl is uh, its become a, a national holiday here in the U.S. Lots of parties, massive TV coverage, decorations and displays in the stores, lots of parties, massive TV coverage, decorations. Um, despite the hype, however, maybe you saw that according to the Nielsen ratings, this is the lowest uh, viewership uh, number of people viewed this in 11 years. Can you believe it? Under 100 million people watched the Super Bowl this year. It kind of makes you sad for them, doesn't it? And unless you're a big fan of defensive battles, the last game was pretty boring. I mean, 13-3, to New England over L.A., no touchdowns in the first three quarters. Well, most viewers get excited about the game. There's a, a lot of people who just get excited about the halftime show and, of course, those commercials. And you might as well get excited about them. If you saw the latest figure on this, this goes up every year. 30 seconds this year cost $5.25 million. And that doesn't count the production costs. That's just the airing costs. So $5.25 million for a 30-second so, uh, shot. I've um, already forgot, gotten most of them. The only one that I could actually remember when I thought about it this week was that one with Harrison Ford and the dog who ordered dog food uh, with uh, Alexa, right? I think that's the only commercial that I actually remember. So what does all this football chatter have to do with today's sermon? I am so glad you asked that question. The Apostle Paul used a lot of sports references in his writing. He talked about Wrestling, boxing, running, and winning uh, medals or crowns. And I'm sure that if he were writing today, he would have made um, uh, analogies to football, baseball, and basketball. In this passage, we're going to see some athletic terms. Maybe you saw them. I suggested in the shout-out that you tried to see just four verses in today's passage. So let's pick it up and read the entire four verses right now. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 27. He wrote, Whatever happens... Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending, that's a sports word, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, <clears throat> without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul is challenging, and he did challenge these Philippians and us to become champions in their Christian faith. They faced stiff opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Temptations to sin and discouragement from constant persecution. They needed to make some strides in their faith, but there were a lot of opponents, a lot of people seeking to knock them down as they're trying to make progress. Just like us, they could feel like underdogs in the day-to-day -day combat and the struggles of life. And so Paul gives very practical insight on how to become winners, how to become Christian champions. To begin with, champions are born on the practice field of persistence. Again, verse uh, 27 of our passage, just the first part of it. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Before ever suiting up, players are taught a few fundamentals of the game. Before tackling the challenges of daily Christian living, we also need to have a working knowledge of the truth. We need to be learning the truth. For many years, Sports was a big part of our family life. Our oldest son, Kevin, started playing little guy football <clears throat> in the fourth grade when he put on those pads for the very first time. And I have to tell you, when I went out to watch their practice, I kind of cracked up because here are these little fourth graders, and they had their pads, their shoulder pads on, and their helmets, and they looked like a bunch of bumblebees. They were all top-heavy, kind of stumbling around like this. And the ball would be hiked, and they would just kind of run into each other, and then they'd all go down. And then they'd get up again, kind of, it took, took a while to kind of get back into position again. And the same thing would happen over and over again. So Kevin stayed with it from little guy football, and he moved on to uh, play at Gladstone High School and eventually Fort Wheaton College. Susan was in third grade when she hit the basketball court 
trying to coordinate walking and dribbling and occasionally shooting. It wasn't unusual to have a game where the final score was like five to three. Um, later on, she stuck with the sports idea and she became a, a football manager at Taylor University. Anna, our older daughter, uh, tried playing soccer, but she was always more the fashion place. So she was most concerned that her shoes and her socks and her shorts and her shirt matched. And for her, a successful game is if she never quite made contact with the ball during the entire time. But during junior high and high school, she was a cheerleader. And so she was always very engaged in that. Christopher, our youngest, played football as a little guy and then through junior high and high school and then on to uh, Taylor University. He's, he's, by the way, where Lois is now in New York uh, for about a week with he and his five, count them, five children. So uh, Lois is engaged in a little sports herself right now. During those years, Lois and I logged a lot of hours in the bleachers, cheering them on to victory, consoling them in defeat. And I'm very glad that our kids had that experience for a number of reasons, because as a result of doing that, they learned teamwork, they learned to, to develop character through wins and losses, and they learned to practice perseverance. They also learned the fundamentals of their games because they were drilled into them by the coaches and by the referees. It was great to see how their skill levels increased over a season and certainly through the years. They just got better and better at it because they stayed with it. Now, I played sports growing up as well, but never on an organized school team. I played, uh, most of the games I played were in the street or somebody's backyard. And I kind of understand the basics of football from the first down to touchdowns, but I really can't tell you much about the strategy. I can't tell you much about the game plans. We played what we called rat ball style. So that meant a lot of elbow, elbowing and a lot of kicking through a game. Uh, the last person standing is the one who won. Um, I got an, an idea by watching what a blitz was, a Hail Mary, a fair catch, clipping, false start, draw plays, those kind of things. But after that, you know, I, I watch football games with people who really know the game, and they're describing all kinds of things that are going on, and I'm just kind of, you know, saying, oh, all I know is you've got to get across that line to score. So that's about it. Now, if I had to do over again, I would join the teams just to understand and practice the fundamentals. There's no way to compete in the games successfully unless you learn the fundamentals. Even if you have natural coordination, even if you're a particularly strong person, you have to spend some time in team meetings and poring over playbooks to understand the fundamentals. Even the pros who play for big money and they've been playing for years periodically need to do the review. And in the same way, there are fundamentals. There are basic truths that we need to understand and review if we're going to live victorious Christian lives. We really need to do that. Um, in this passage, Paul re refers to these basics. He talks about contending together for the faith of the gospel or simply the faith or the word of truth. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Jude 3, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write to urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. 2 Timothy 2.15, any Awana student or graduate should know first, or 2 Timothy 2.15 pretty well. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth, like handling of all, correctly handles the word of truth. 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Obviously, you can't live in a manner worthy of the gospel or contend for the faith of the gospel if you don't know what the gospel is, if you don't have a grasp of what the gospel is. Now, hopefully most of us know the bottom line truths that are essential for us to be born again. I like to call 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the gospel in a nutshell. And by the way, we just basically sang this passage. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so that basic movement is laid out for us in that passage, the gospel in a nutshell. Hopefully all of us would be able to quote in some translation or another. If you're old enough, it'll be King James. If you're younger, it might be some other translation. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Hopefully you're familiar with John 1.12, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. By believing and receiving Christ, we're born again into his eternal family. But we need to move beyond these basics in our understanding, or we're going to live our lives as spiritual rookies. We're never going to get beyond the most basic things. I think we'll make little impact for the kingdom. I think we're constantly going to be tackled and sidelined by the world, the flesh, and the devil if we don't have a grasp of some fundamentals. So we understand and review them. Like the basics of prayer. To study God's word. What, how to study God's word. The importance of the church. What Christian stewardship looks like. The basics of witnessing that is the, the truth of the gospel and your own personal testimony. Also the ground rules of morality, of ethics, of marriage, of resisting temptation. They're like hash marks. They're like boundary lines that we need to be familiar with if we're going to contend effectively. Can you explain the biblical process for resolving disagreements and disputes with other Christians? Without resorting to gospel, gossip or tattling to the leaders or using congregational meetings or the court system, do you know how to go about reconciling with a brother or sister from whom you have become estranged? If a Christian friend is unhappy in his or her marriage, what biblical counsel would you give them? Or would it tend more, well, you just kind of go with your feelings, whatever you're feeling, and feelings kind of become the most important part. Do you know what the Bible says about the whole area of biblical marriage and reconciliation. As a church, we have a responsibility to repeatedly teach the basics. At some point, I I hope to offer some seminars. And these seminars are focused on some of the basics, some of the fundamentals that I think believers need to have a working knowledge of. One of the seminars I may do is called Get a Grip on Your Sword. It's the basics of how to study God's word for yourself without relying on videos to do it for you. Uh, Other seminars, uh, one called Peace Table Talks, and it deals with biblical communication and reconciliation where there has been estrangement. I have a seminar that I may offer called the Ministry Training Institute, which helps you discover what your shape is for ministry. It, it It includes spiritual gifts, but it also looks at heart passions and abilities and personality and experiences and how God uses all of those same things to shape us into the person that he wants us to be and then for specific ministries along the line. Now it's important that the church does a good job of laying foundations in our children's ministry and in our student ministries. But we also need to be equipping adults in these basic truths and skills for our life on the gridiron. Now, in addition to learning the truth, there's a learning part to this and also the review of some of the things that maybe we've known in the past, but periodically we just need to kind of put them in a form that we can remember them and and so that we can apply them appropriately. But in addition to that, champions also need to live the testimony. Learn the truth and live the testimony. The best way to impact our world for Christ, which I'd call an offense, and to resist Satan, which I call a defense, isn't a stirring sermon. It's not a powerful book or a mountaintop experience that makes the difference. The greatest impact comes from Christians living day in and day out through their life and words, living the Christian life. Imagine if you heard that Hillary Clinton, Kim Kardashian, Prince Harry, and Warren Buffett had just come to Christ. Maybe there'd be some articles written in Guidepost magazine or interviews on the 700 Club. But more likely than not, a few of us might be skeptical. We might say, what's really going on here? 
Um, testimony of a conversion to Christ, I think, can be compared to going on a diet, uh, giving up drinking or smoking. That is when somebody makes the declaration, hey, I've started this new plan, I'm on this new diet, I'm going to do this workout regime, and everything is going to be great. But we usually, when we live for a while, we say, well, time will tell, right? Time will tell. We'll see if they actually stick to it. The things that make people notice is how we respond in the flow of life over the years. That's called a testimony, okay? A testimony is not just a one-shot deal. A testimony is a track record. It's a track record, record over time. That's why we're talking about persistence. Let's remember the truths that are found in 2 Corinthians 3. through. I really like this. It says, you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on stone, but on tablets <coughs> of human hearts. I came across this poem several years ago. Maybe some of you have read it before. You're writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men, read what you write, whether faithful or true, just what is the gospel according to you? I think that's pretty good, isn't it? Right? What is the gospel according to you? What are people seeing when they're looking at your life, not just in the moment, but over the long haul. How's your gospel coming along so far? Is your gospel good news to those who live with you or live around you? Do people get the point by watching you? Stay with it. Be persistent and let God build a story in your life that's worth reading. It's hard work. No question about it, and we need a lot of support if we're going to be champions. So it's not just the stuff we know, it's not even just the stuff that we do, because the second principle on becoming a Christian champion is that champions are developed on the track of teamwork. They're developed on the track of teamwork. A recurring theme throughout this interim season is that teamwork is essential. Teamwork is essential for optimum effectiveness. Now, if you're just a casual fan of pro football, you probably know a few names of the superstars. These are the guys who make the big yardage, they score the touchdowns, they pack the stands, they draw huge contracts. Most of the pregame hype was focused on New England's quarterback Tom Brady and the LA Rams quarterback Jared Goff. They are the ones who tend to get the credit for the wins and the blame for the losses. Both of those guys, future Hall of Famers. Now, if you watch the last Super Bowl, however, you know that it wasn't the quarterbacks that made the difference at all. It was the guys who were protecting them. It was the defensive players. You take away that kind of support and protection from less famous players, and the superstars don't look very super anymore. Not even a quarterback of Tom Brady's caliber could do much without the big guys that protect him, right? and the guys that go on the defense to make sure that the other team doesn't score. The teams that make it to the playoffs, the teams that make it to Super Bowls, understand and appreciate the fact this is a team sport. Offense and defense, backfield and linemen, they're all needed. They develop, they practice, and they perfect plays that so, so that every man knows exactly where he, he uh, is to be, uh, and he also needs to know where everybody else is. You see, it really isn't 11 men playing. It's one team working together. And that's the point that Paul makes on the value of teamwork with the phrase in verse 27, which he talks about, stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Standing together as one man for the faith of the gospel. The Greek word, soon athleo, is a compound word made of athleo, which we get the word athletics from that, or sports, and soon is a prefix that means with or together. So the Christian life isn't easy, and because of that, we need lots of help from other believers just to keep going. We need other believers for accountability. We also need practical assistance in so many aspects of Christian life and ministry. This thought is further developed in the passages on spiritual gifts that uses this analogy of the human bodies. Many parts, many members, one body. 
Individual believers are like eyes and ears and feet and hands and noses. But we have one head, Jesus. We have one heart, the Holy Spirit. We carry out our individual functions, but we do so in concert with all the other members of the body. Now, periodically, a big-headed superstar will try to take all the glory. They'll give the impression that they can pretty much win the game on their own. But more than a few of those guys have left the Super Bowl field on a golf cart after a serious injury. Arrogance, getting too big for our britches, seeking attention and control can be big problems in churches as well. We call them power brokers. 3 John, verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. I was talking about this guy that kind of rose up and he thought he was the most important. Now, I want to ask you, Christian, what team are you playing on? What position do you play on the team? Now, I'm not talking about just what church you attend or even one where you become an official member. I'm talking about that group of people with whom you unite for testimony, with whom you unite for ministry. When you're on the job, when you're on the campus, who are the other believers with whom you meet for prayer and strategy and saying, how are we going to impact this workplace for Christ? How are we going to impact this campus for Christ? It's not a matter of doing that alone. It's saying that we do this in partnership. We function like a team. Champions play team ball. In the church, these are those who work together in children's ministry and, and working with teenagers in music and other ministry teams. We're most effective when we stand firm in one spirit, when we contend together as one man for the faith of the gospel. In addition to teamwork, enabling us to become more effective, we also need each other for ongoing encouragement. Ongoing encouragement. Now you watch a winning team, and you'll probably see signs of what we call esprit de corps. Lots of mutual encouragement. It's the high fives after a big play and the consoling pat or embrace after the fumble. Those gestures say this is a team. We're in it together, win or lose so that when the competition gets fierce and you're playing on the opponent's field and the opposing fans are chiding your progress and cheering your setbacks, you got to turn to the team. you got to turn to the team. It's a real team that pulls together and plays the best game possible when you're in those circumstances. So Paul talks to this Philippian church about the need to draw together in order to overcome fear and in the face of strong opposition. Let's go back to verse 27 in our passage. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. People are used to seeing the hostility the infighting and divisions in politics. That's just part of the game, right? And they expect to see it in businesses. It happens on sport time, uh, sports teams. It happens in families, and unfortunately, it happens in churches. So when we see a body of Christians who work hard on conflict resolution, they're impressed. It says this church is a cut above. This is not the normal, self-centered, ego-driven bunch. And that's a sign that our relationship with Christ is genuine and may even highlight the spiritual void in the lives of unbelievers. Verse 28 says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, <clears throat> but you will be saved, and that by God. During this interim season, we're going to be working very hard to develop stronger teamwork within and among Bethel's ministries. The children's ministry, the student ministries, worship, missions, women, security, small groups, elders, deacons, finance. Most of you know, and I've been sharing with you, that at our elders' meetings now, we're taking the first part of those meetings to do some training on what it means to be an elder, what are the functions 
of an elder. And what we're working on is how we can come to greater unity together, how we can function better as a team. And that's so important. We want to model that kind of teamwork, that kind of esprit de corps for the entire church. In time, I'm going to introduce uh, places where people who are in, uh, involved in leadership in any of the ministries here at Bethel can come together periodically for what I call huddles, where we can all be on the same page, where we're not functioning independently, even in our ministries, but we're functioning together, and we're getting in that huddle, and we're talking about what we're trying to do together to advance the gospel, how we want to do a better job of training and equipping on the inside, and how we want to do a better job of reaching those who are outside of Christ. And we do that best when we join hearts and hands and resources together to exalt Jesus and to advance his kingdom. The question is, and this is a critical question, and it's the one we're working on right now, and that is whether Bethel is going to pull together or whether we're going to pull apart. Are we going to pull together as a team or are we going to pull apart? That's a decision to make. As in the world of sports, Christian champions are born on the practice field of persistence. They're developed on the track of teamwork, and finally, champions are proven in the stadium of suffering. They're proven in the stadium of suffering. Beginning in verse 29, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. When it comes to suffering, expect it. Expect it. If you watched the Super Bowl, you saw some suffering. Some of it was physical as players left the field with various injuries, and some of it was emotional, especially for the Rams. There are bound to be injuries when a 350-pound lineman comes crashing through to sack and to maim. That's their purpose, right? And during that game, catchable passes are dropped and balls are fumbled and plays are broken up. As the final seconds of the game ticked off the clock, if you watched, you saw L.A. coach Sean McVay, by the way, 33-year-old coach. Can you believe that? They had a 33-year-old coach against the 66-year-old common uh, coach in Tom Belichick, but a 33-year-old coach, <clears throat> and you saw him look stunned and numbed. I mean, he actually went into that, that game and he expected to win. Um, looking forward to the, the Super Bowl ring, looking forward to the Vince Lombardi trophy, looking forward to the big payoff of $201,000 bonus for every player on the winning team. And the poor losers only got $59,000 bonus. I don't know how they're making it. These men worked all season long and even career long to get to that point. And I can imagine the Rams feeling downcast. Why did we ever get into the Super Bowl to begin with? It might have been better if we had just lost the NFC championship to the Saints. And if it wasn't for those terrible calls by the refs, they probably would have. But I'll preach that another time. In the world of the NFL, this game is what it's all about. It's all about playing in the Super Bowl, and it's all about winning the Super Bowl. So when you lose, it's hard, and you suffer. That kind of suffering goes with the territory. And pro football players expect the suffering as part of the big game in the big leagues, and somehow when they win, the suffering makes it even sweeter. Last Sunday, I mentioned several of Paul's experiences in suffering, from be beatings, false arrests, imprisonment, shipwrecks, snake bites, legal hassles. He knew all about suffering. But rather than complaining about all this, he explained suffering in the most amazing way. Verse 29. He says, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. He's, he's talking like suffering is some kind of a gift. It's some kind of a, a bonus. He told these Philippian Christians to expect 
some kinds of suffering because of their commitment to Christ. He knew from experience as well as from the words of the Lord Jesus. John 16, I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. My generation, I'm a baby boomer. At those of us born between 1946 and 1964. And our generation hasn't, for the most part, had to suffer the same way that our parents' generation and the generation before us, they're known as the builders. Now, I lost a few classmates in the Vietnam conflict. But during the Second World War, it was not unusual for half of a graduating class to die in combat. I know what it is to tighten my belt financially a little bit, but I've never had to go through the devastation of a national depression. And because of that, we baby boomers have tended to think that we should be able to cruise through life without any major struggles. And then when something hard comes our way, we can feel shocked and violated and say it's not fair, just not fair. But mature people understand that suffering goes with the territory. Suffering goes with the territory of life especially if we're involved in high-stakes kinds of ventures, from business to investments to ministry projects. It's naive to think that we're going to float through life unscathed by suffering. Sometimes the sales chart will plunge rather than surge off the chart. Sometimes children will get very sick. Sometimes dear friends will come to untimely deaths. Sometimes we'll be diagnosed with cancer or some other life-threatening disease. Sometimes, despite our best prayer and planning and ministry ventures, we'll have minimal results. They really won't seem to move the ball down the field at all. When that happens, we kind of double over in pain. We grimace and we wonder if life, and especially the Christian life, is worth it because we're suffering. We're suffering. But it's in the stadium of suffering that champions are revealed to the throngs of bystanders. We have a great picture of that, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 12. It's after that great chapter 11, which we call the, the hall of faith. You know, all those people who lived by faith and had amazing exploits of faith. And the writer of the Hebrews wrote, <clears throat> Since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily tri trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people then you won't become weary and give up. It's in the stadium of suffering that we have a choice to either trust God, relying on his strength, or to fold up in bitterness and despair. It doesn't do any good to go on and on about how unfair life is and why others seem to have such an easier life. So when... The suffering comes, we may reel from the shock, we may go through various stages like denial, anger, and bargaining, but in time, we ex accept the reality that suffering is as much a part as pleasure is. Paul challenged the Philippians and us to a new level of response to suffering beyond simply expecting it and enduring it. He says we need to exploit it. We need to exploit it. He describes suffering as a kind of gift or privilege from God rather than as a curse. Again, verse 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. I want to briefly list a few benefits which can come from a proper response to suffering. The first, suffering serves as evidence that we have made a genuine commitment to Christ. 
Suffering serves as evidence that we've made a genuine commitment to Christ. 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Second, suffering can bring greater attention to Jesus Christ and therefore advance the kingdom. That was certainly true in Paul's case. We saw him and we saw where he was in prison and he was in undergoing these terrible things against his body. And we find he and Silas experiencing and exuding the joy of the Lord, singing songs at midnight, and it had an impact on the people who were around, specifically the Philippian jailer and his family. Third, suffering properly will be rewarded by God. It will be rewarded by God. Matthew 5, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those rewards are much more significant, by the way, than a little ring or a shiny trophy. Suffering for Christ will be rewarded. Number four, suffering encouraging, encourages us to focus on the eternal rather than on the temporal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen. For what is, unseen, what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Number five, or, uh, yeah, five, suffering can mature us. Suffering can mature us. First Peter 5.10, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Suffering can strengthen you. Seven, or six rather, suffering can draw us into more intimate fellowship with the Lord. Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. More intimate fellowship with the Lord because Jesus suffered and we're suffering. Number seven, suffering can cause us to be more compassionate and empathetic with others, opening greater opportunities for ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with comfort through Christ. In the context of this passage, suffering is like a stadium at the Super Bowl. As people see the reality of our faith, as they see God's faithfulness, they can be drawn to Him. It's in the big game, and the stakes are high, but the rewards of victory are great as well. As a matter of fact, we may have a greater impact for Christ in our suffering than in anything we will do or say in the normal flow of this life. Because when we suffer the way Paul is instructing. People are going to see the courage. They're going to see the grace. They're going to see the joy coming through, even in those difficult circumstances, and say something like this, how about them Christians? How about them Christians? Do you see how they take it? And do you see how they rejoice through it? That, folks, is when we know we got the real deal. Now, to a certain degree, I, I think we could say that Bethel is playing a Super Bowl game right now. You've experienced some suffering in the last several months, and even before that. You've experienced some suffering. The question is, are you going to be persistent? Are you going to continue to walk with God? Are you going to play as a team? Are you going to come together as a team? Are you going to show that suffering and experience that suffering in a way that gives honor to God and advances his kingdom? Now, I don't know when your next big Super Bowl may come in life, but when it comes, 
exploit it for all it's worth. Let God use it to glorify his name, to advance his kingdom like he did with Paul's suffering, his imprisonment. Not everybody's suffering is going to be the same, but we're going to be measured carefully by a God who knows how much we can handle. God knows how much we can handle, and he measures our suffering according to that. I'm going to ask you to pull out the connection card if you haven't yet done that. And bow with me if we spend just a couple of moments in prayer and reflection. Jesus, there may be people in this room that this is kind of going over their head because uh, they're not going through anything particularly challenging right now. Uh, maybe suffering, just kind of a interesting thought. Maybe they've read stories about it, but um, they're young enough or inexperienced enough that it just doesn't relate. Others in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. They get it. And Father, I would pray for all of us that we'll learn the lessons that we need to learn even this side of the big challenges. That we learn the principles. That we live the testimony in whatever it is that we're facing right now. Father, especially I want to pray for Bethel Church that as we continue to work our way through a difficult season, we will uh, pull together as a team. When Satan is doing everything that he possibly can to pull us apart, Lord, I pray that we will pull together, that we'll encourage one another, that we'll pray for one another, that we'll work through and settle some of the disputes and differences that we have with one another. Because we want to honor Jesus Christ through all of this. I pray that we will exploit this for the glory of God. And as a result of that, we're going to have a corporate testimony to this town of North Platte like never before. Because of a God who's been faithful. Because we have placed our trust in him. Father, I pray that we will continue to write our gospels over the long haul so that people read our lives and that they're directed to the Lord Jesus. They understand the gospel, the good news of Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we walk through this time together, we're going to see your glory in a whole new way. We're going to be able to rejoice in a whole new way because of who you are and because of what you're doing among us. Father, one of the things that has been strong even during this difficult time has been the faithfulness of so many people here at Bethel in their service, in their worship, and also, Lord, in their giving, their finances. And I thank you for the resources that have been provided for life and ministry here. And Lord, whether we give on Sunday, on today, as the plates are passed, or whether we uh, give during the week, I pray, Lord, we're doing that because we love you and because we're committed to the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in this place and around the world. Together through our giving and through our ministry, Lord, we want to stand strong. And we take this stand for Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things in his name. Amen.